The Roman philosopher Cicero famously declared that in times of war, the law falls silent. In his classic novel, 1984, George Orwell envisioned a future in which the government claims to be in constant war in order to justify repressive measures against its own population. Are there parallels to post 9-11 America? With the presidential election just a month away in today's broadcast of Talking Foreign Policy, our expert panel will be discussing the timely question of presidential power in a war without end. I'm your host, Michael Scharf. We'll begin our conversation with Jack Goldsmith, who had been Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel during the Bush administration. He's the author of the new book, Power and Constraint, The Accountable President After 9-11. But first, the news. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy, produced by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 FM Idea Stream. I'm your host, Michael Scharf, the Associate Dean for Global Legal Studies at Case Western Law School. I'm talking today with Jack Goldsmith, the author of the new book, Power and Constraint, The Accountable Presidency After 9-11. Jack, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Michael, for having me. So, Jack, in a recent presentation on C-SPAN Book TV, which I happen to catch, you said that in this endless war on terrorism, you worry as much about the excess powers of the president as you do about the terrorist threat. In this regard, can you tell us what keeps you up at night? Um, in terms of presidential power, I, the thing that keeps me up at night most generally is the excessive secrecy of the executive branch. Um, it is that the, the executive branch secrecy, secrecy bureaucracy is broader than it's ever been. Millions and millions of people have class, access to classified information, which, it, which it's illegal to disclose to the public expe- except through very circumscribed means. And the executive branch gets to determine what gets classified as secret. And so I worry that in this endless war with so much being classified and the president determining the scope of the classification, uh, that's what I worry about. Let me just say that the, the secrecy bureaucracy is more porous than it's ever been, but it's also larger than it's ever been. So there are reasons to think that lots of stuff is leaking out, but there's also reasons to think that a lot of stuff isn't leaking out. So when it comes to our concerns, yours are not about the warrantless wiretaps or the assertions of um, of extraordinary interrogation methods or black sites or military commissions or targeted killings. It's it comes down for you for what they're not telling well, us. It's well, I'm, I'm I'm I think that the substance of almost all of our counterterrorism policies is in a pretty good place. I think the substance of the counterterrorism policies have been largely blessed by Congress and or the courts and have largely have the approval of the American people. Um, so based on the, 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 the contours of what we know about our counter-ter- counterterrorism programs, I'm pretty satisfied with. I've got quibbles at the margins. But um, the thing I worry about is that there's a lot we don't know and that a lot of mistakes happen in secret. And now the thesis of your new book is that the biggest surprise about President Obama is that he's actually continued President Bush's controversial counterterrorism policies without much change at all, even practices that President Obama specifically criticized in his presidential campaign. Which policies in particular do you see this as a continuation? There are a lot of them. Um, The main ones are, I would say, military detention without trial, military detention, um, the broad assertion of the state secrets privilege. He's continued uh, the warrantless surveillance, which was approved by Congress in 2008, but he criticized it and has continued that. He's ramped up targeted killings um, outside the United States from the baseline of the Bush administration. And again, this is not his fault. I think he wanted to do this, but he's failed to close Gitmo. All right. So the claim of continuity is not one that the Obama supporters are too crazy about. Um, They would like to see Obama as different than the Bush administration, in particular with respect to respect for the rule of law. So how do you explain this continuity, the fact that two different presidents of two different parties who have such different approaches could end up with the same policies? So this is one of the burdens of my book is to explain that paradox. How did two different, such different presidents end up in about the same place? I offer lots of reasons for it, uh, the, but the main one that I argue for and that not everyone agrees with is that they ended up in the same place because there are larger structural forces outside of the preferences and inclinations of the presidents that led them to that place. So 
um, courts and Congress, with the help of NGOs and the press, did an extraordinary job of pushing back against some of the excesses of the Bush administration, pushing him through law, through politics, through persuasion, through force, to a place that by the end of his term was a much more moderate set of, of counterterrorism policies, and they had much uh, firmer legal blessing. And then Obama inherited those policies, and they turned out to be a lot more legitimate. And when he got into office, there was a lot more need for them than he had known as a candidate on the outside. And then in the areas when he tried to, he actually did try to push away, most notably on Guantanamo Bay and closing Guantanamo Bay and having criminal trials, the very same forces that pushed back against Bush, pushing Bush to the center, pushed Obama to the center, and uh, but didn't allow him to do that. So I think that the story of the continuity is really a story of these larger structural forces, I would call them constitutional forces, pushing back against the presidents. And would you add to the list of forces the lawyers on the inside for example, yourself and the folks at the State Department Office of Legal Advisor. Absolutely. A big part of the story uh, that I tell that I didn't mention just now is not just lawyers on the inside, but all sorts of institutions that have grown up since the 1970s inside the executive branch to watch and check and vet what the executive is doing. These forces are hard to see. They're hard sometimes to convince people that they have any effect. But I think there's no doubt that they were inspectors generals, lawyers, ethics monitors, no doubt that they were consequential in watching what the president was doing and, and pushing back against him. And so to be clear, if you look at the Obama policies, they're very different from the Bush administration policies in the first two years, yes. but very similar to the Bush administration policies in the last two years. That's right. Now, you were a high-level Pentagon lawyer and then later the assistant attorney general in the Bush administration in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel. And in your previous book, The Terror Presidency, you wrote that the Bush administration felt overly constrained by the law. Did President Bush succeed at all in expanding the powers of the presidency, which I know was one of his goals in the post-9-11 years? So as you say, that was certainly his goal was to expand the powers of the presidency. It's a very hard question to answer because obviously after 9-11, when there's a war, an authorized war by Congress, there's going to be an expansion of presidential power. Um, but along many dimensions, I think Bush, his attempts to expand presidential power ended up being self-defeating because some of his unnecessarily broad assertions and proclamations of executive power, I think, invited worried people and invited the pushback from Congress, the courts, the press, NGOs and the like that led to a whole array of constraints, small and large, on the presidency now in the conduct of the war on terror. And picturing this as a pendulum that swung in the early years to the right and has swung back, are you suggesting that it's about in the right place now, that the constraints are just about right? That's not quite my claim. I, I try hard in the book not to make that claim, and I'll explain why. I do think that what's happened is that we can be pretty confident that the institutions of our government and of civil society are watching the presidency closely and can push back if he goes in the wrong direction. Whether we're in exactly the right place on counterterrorism policies, I think is an impossible question to answer. We'd have to know a lot more about the threat. We'd have to know a lot more about the efficacy of various counterterrorism techniques. I don't know personally whether the broad surveillance powers the president's using is necessary. I don't know if every single person needs to be detained at Gitmo. I don't need know if we need a more aggressive policy. So I would say that I'm comfortable where we are. The American people and the courts and Congress seem comfortable where we are. But I wouldn't say we've got exactly the optimal policies. And when you mentioned that the American people are comfortable, the opinion polls have changed over the years. Some opinion polls 10 years ago showed a much higher degree of discomfort with extraordinary interrogation or torture right. um, and, and some of the other things. Uh, the American p people, according to the polls, are very much in favor of the targeted killing that some academics like myself still feel are controversial. Would you say that this is because of the legislative and judicial responses that have legitimized these policies? Is, is that your theory? That's my basic theory. I think it has to do with a couple of things. But the main point is, is that the policies that were controversial and that, were, that had less support were not the same policies as we have now. The policies have been changed. And when the courts say that a detention in Guantanamo is lawful, that sends a much different and much more comforting signal to the American people than when the president just says it on his own. And when Congress steps in and says certain interrogation techniques aren't allowed and the people know that the interrogation techniques that are going forward now are taking place within those constraints, they can have more confidence in them. 
So I think you have to look at what kind of broad political and legal support the policies have. And I think this is a broad generalization, but the American people's comfort with these policies largely tracks those other institutions' comforts with them. So would, would you say that the institutional legitimacy has created a new normal where right after 9-11, the American people weren't quite ready to embrace some of these techniques that were necessary for national security, but now that they've been constrained and blessed, the American people now find it comfortable? I do think that's uh, that, that's not the way I would put it, but no. I think that's an accurate description. I think that we do, I guess I do use the phrase new normal in a slightly different sense in the book, but I do think we are now after... After 11 years where there was, as always happens in war, there was an aggressive reaction by the president right after an attack. The pendulum has swung back. The other institutions have engaged. We've had debates, very open public debates, lots of leaking of information. And all these issues have been debated. They've run through the mill of Congress and the courts and public opinion. And I do think we've got an equilibrium now, I would call it, where people are generally comfortable about where we are. Now, it could change at any moment, and I don't think everything is settled, but I think things are largely settled for now. Now, do you think there was also a role to be played by some of the policymakers in their rhetoric? So, for example, Vice President Cheney spent eight years in office telling the American people that if we didn't do extraordinary interrogation techniques, we couldn't stop the next terrorist uh, offense against us, and also making the claim, which turned out to be false, that the evidence that was used to locate and kill Osama bin Laden came from these extraordinary interrogation techniques, these things that some people call torture. So some of the rhetoric of the Bush administration, I do think, invited unnecessary criticism. And I do think sometimes they exaggerated their criticism. I don't know if they exaggerated their 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 claims about the nature of the threat. Uh, I think that that if you generally look at what the Bush administration said in the last four or five years about the nature of the threat, it's pretty similar to what President Obama says now. But I do think some of their rhetoric was overcharged, and especially their rhetoric about presidential power and the need for it was largely self-defeating. All right. So we've set the stage for an interesting discussion, and we're going to bring in some other experts. It's now time for a short break. Not everyone agrees with Jack's argument that there isn't much difference between the foreign policy approach of the two candidates. So when we return, we'll bring in the legal director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, a former high-level State Department official, and an international law professor that will all jump into the conversation and we'll try to ferret out what the American people need to know as this election looms. You're listening to Talking Foreign Policy. Back in a moment. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy. I'm Michael Scharf, and I've been talking with Harvard Law Professor Jack Goldsmith, the author of Power and Constraint, The Accountability Presidency After 9-11. Let's widen the discussion now by bringing in our panel of experts. At the top of the program, I mentioned the phenomenon of war without end. Let me introduce Milena Stereo, who's been on the program before. She's an international law professor at Cleveland State's Marshall College of Law. Milena. Good to have you back. Thank you. It's a pleasure. From the standpoint of an international law professor and from the standpoint of U.S. constitutional law as well, would you say that the war on terrorism has become a sort of war without end that has shifted the power balance between Americans and their government? Yes, I agree with that assessment. Essentially, under the Bush administration and now under the Obama administration, the approach to some of the policies, for example, the targeted killing policy, the drone strikes, has been the executive makes decision as to who can be targeted. We have to trust the executive with what the policy is, when it will end, if it will end. There's really sort of no check and, ba and balance on the presidential power to do that. So I think, and the other thing is we don't really know if the war on terror will ever end, what the parameters of, of that war are. And for all we know, it could be another 100-year war. Now, George Bush was the one that coined the phrase the war on terror. And I believe the Obama administration has modified that to be the war on al-Qaeda. But it's still a war in both it's, administrations' view, right? It's still a war. Um, under the Bush administration, we were engaged in a global war on terror. Now we're engaged in a war against the al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. So if you think of that phrase, associated forces, that can be just about anyone. And you think this rhetoric of war changes the way that the Americans perceive the government and the, the free range that the government has in taking actions? Yes, because I think 
if you were to poll you know, our citizens, I think everybody would agree that at a time of war, things change. Civil liberties can be curtailed. I think that's a relatively well-accepted premise. And so if the rhetoric is we're at a war, we're engaged in an armed conflict, that I think gives a lot of liberty to the executive branch to craft all sorts of policies. Now, we're also joined today in studio by Mike Newton. Uh, Mike was a former military attorney who served as the deputy to the ambassador at large for war crimes issues at the State Department, and now he's a law professor at Vanderbilt. Mike's been on with us before. It's good to have you back, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Now, Mike, you were also a former JAG colonel for many years. Do you agree with Malena's conclusions from that point of view? Well, from the military perspective, uh, for for any military operation, the, the, the job of the commander in chief is to prescribe a wartime objective. And are we at war? Well, in the, in the sense that there's an active enemy that is trying to harm American interests and kill Americans, yes, we are. Remembering, of course, that it's also an armed conflict, to use the legal sense of the term, that is authorized by both the United States and uh, UN Security Council and the, the Congress of the United States. The problem, of course, being that the scope and, and the definite military objective is much more vague and uncertain than has ever been the case in American history, I think. And the other paradox is the statistic, the last statistic I saw is that only 0.5% of the American people have been directly involved in that. So we're, we're at war in the sense that, that people conceive of it as this very distant, very dim, and yet for the American military service members and, and women on the ground, it's very real and very dangerous. All right, so would you say that the Iraq part of the war is over now? I know we still have troops there, but Obama says the war is over. Well, it's true agree? both legally and, and politically. The sovereign independent state is, has, has stood up and therefore they're a sovereign equal like any other. We, we no longer have the right to simply invoke the, the wartime okay. law, the flag, to do anything we want to do in now, Iraq. In Afghanistan, we're still in war, mm -hmm. but there is an agreement between the United States and the Afghan government, and we're supposed to be out of there in two years. Yes. So at that point, the war is over in Afghanistan. Uh, in the sense that it changes the legal regime applicable, yes, it is. Um, so will there still be a global war against al-Qaeda that exists after the two geographic wars are over? Well, the, the issue is then uh, how the United States Congress goes back and reshapes the authorization for the use of military force. I think uh, scholars, and I know Jack has written about this and talked about this, is uh, how you define the enemy, and, and more particularly when in the context of interrogation policy, how do you define the end state? Because at the moment the conflict is over, any articulable legal authority you've got to hold somebody in the absence of a conviction ends immediately. And so that's why the lawyers among us really care about that. And in particular, that's why the military people care. Remember, the military, from the institutional perspective, wants to win the war and go home. They don't want to stay deployed for the next hundred years. But the politicians are saying that this is a war that may last generation. After and the military generation. will dutifully follow the orders right. of the commander in chief. Well, the final member of our panel of experts today is Bahar Azmi. He's the legal director of the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York City. Bahar, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Michael. So, Bahar, you've litigated a number of the leading cases arising out of the so-called war on terror, including those related to indefinite executive detention, extraordinary rendition, and torture. Do you believe that the so-called war on terror has led to a, a diminution in our civil liberties? Oh, I, I, I certainly do. Um, I, I think um, just to underscore one of the, the, the points in Jack's book, some of, I think, the most egregious practices of the, the Bush administration from the, the first term, like extraordinary rendition, secret black sites, incommunicado, military detention, secret detention in Guantanamo, um, were, were largely constrained during the Bush administration. Um, but still other, I, I think, deeply controversial practices have endured across the administrations, as, as Jack describes, and that includes the idea of uh, an indefinite preventative detention regime based on, on military law principles for people in Guantanamo, the use of military commissions instead of civilian uh, courts, and the, the uh, ex dramatic expansion of a targeted killing program. And let me follow up with you on that. I once testified before the House Armed Services Committee about the new Military Commissions Act. And one of the things I said, and I, I want to get your take on it, is that even if somebody is prosecuted at a military commission and acquitted, or let's say prosecuted and given a short sentence and the sentence is over, 
it is unlikely that they will be released. They, in fact, will be detained even after they're acquitted for the rest of their life. Yeah. I, I think this is a really problematic feature of the Obama administration's description of their justice system. So as the way that the way they initially articulated it is if there is overwhelming evidence of guilt, then we'll put them in the uh, Article Three civilian trial box because we'll sure, we're certain there'll be a conviction. If there's insufficient evidence uh, that would support uh, conviction beyond reasonable doubt, then we can put them in the military commissions box. And, and if there's not enough evidence for any of those two, we'll just indefinitely detain them. And I think that's a, a really distorted system of justice where and the, under the prosecutor law, shifts the, right. the, the game. Under the law, Bahar, this would only apply to non-American citizens, right? We're not comfortable having American citizens detained forever in Guantanamo. Uh, that's that's. I mean, I think that's somewhat of an, an open question, at least under Supreme Court precedent. I think there's. Uh, I'd be optimistic that uh, that a U.S. citizen could not be indefinitely detained, but I think the the law is not settled on that. Question. But there are no U.S. citizens now at, at Guantanamo. There are no U.S. citizens now in Guantanamo. But you're saying question, in the future there could be. Uh, or, or the the question of whether a U.S. citizen could be detained in a military brig, as Jose Padilla right. was, which never was conclusively resolved by the Supreme Court, is, and that was in Georgia, a, uh, or South mainland. Carolina, South Carolina. Perhaps, yeah, right. That's right. And and what about people that have dual citizenship? Who are they? Foreigners or U.S. citizens for the purposes I of this? I think they retain the rights of U.S. citizens in that in that circumstance. Yes. Okay. So now, does this mean that you agree with Jack Goldsmith's characterization that President Obama has continued President Bush's national security policies and practices pretty much without change? Yes, I, I I would agree with that. You know, mindful again the distinction that Jack himself makes between the the early Bush administration practices and the and the sort of Bush two practices, which I do agree have carried over. And, and you're troubled by that, I assume. I am, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and Jack says Jack says there are these checks, and the checks have succeeded. But to say that there are some checks is not the same thing as saying that there are sufficient checks. Would you say that Jack is overstating the efficacy of the checks that have constrained presidential power? Um, in 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 uh, in general, yes. I mean, I I I, uh, I don't think um, that Congress has. Uh, uh, um, Played a particularly constructive uh, role here, particularly in in relation to closing Guantanamo. They've made it uh, impossible for the president to try uh, the 9/11 conspirators in in New York. They've made it impossible to resettle, or at least extremely difficult to resettle detainees in the United States, or even resettle them abroad. I think because of narrow uh, political uh, considerations and some some amount of grandstanding. And I think the courts have not been as effective, aside from some, some sort of blockbuster cases at the Supreme Court, um, at a kind of retail level, I don't think the courts have been dutiful in checking the president's Let me actions. stop you there. Wait, just that? hold on a second, Mike, because I'm going to jump in on, and ask you the follow-up question. I, I want to focus us a little bit on what the courts have done with Guantanamo mm-hmm. Bay. So, Mike, this will be a question for you. In, in 2008, the Supreme Court held that Guantanamo Bay detainees are entitled to judicial review, what us lawyers call a process known as habeas proceedings. Right. Now, the district courts have actually ruled in a number of cases that these detainees have to be released because there's insufficient evidence of guilt or insufficient evidence that they are a continuing threat to the United States. Those cases have been appealed to the Court of Appeals in D.C. Mm -hmm. And the D.C. Court of Appeals has done what, Mike, with these cases? Uh, For the most part, um, in every case that I know of, they've reviewed the standards of detention and the reasons for detention brought forth by the executive. They've they've done done what's called a de novo review of the evidence. They looked at all the evidence, which is very difficult because, remember, some of these statements now at this point are a decade old. Uh, in some cases of corroboration where people are dead, and they have affirmed those, so that no detainee has been released under the order of the D.C. Circuit okay, Court so of Appeals. Okay, so just to be clear, the district court says you've got to release them. Mm-hmm. Who's appealing it to the Court of Appeals? Who's bringing these appeals? The Justice Department. The Obama administration? Yes. yes. So the Obama administration who says they believe in habeas and that these people, if they're proven to be innocent or not to be a threat and need to be released, are taking these cases and they're asking the court to keep them in prison in Guantanamo. Well, this is a really important point that you're getting at, which is the balance between the executive obligation to protect Americans as long as there's a continuing threat and somebody needs to be held. This gets back to what Jack was saying about uh, more than 600. uh, The last count I saw was 602 detainees have been released from Guantanamo Bay. 
which began early in the Bush administration, um, accelerated during the second Bush term. And so the, the but people the, at that are, point that these they're are litigating, discretionary the, yes, but releases. the ones that they're litigating at that point have been through multiple, multiple yeah. filters of review. And, and at that point, the executive branch in the form of the Justice Department really feels like that, for whatever reason, uh, they don't need to be released. And remember that there's about a 28 percent recidivism rate of the ones that have been released. And so, you know, these are not just sort of theoretical, legalistic kinds of determinations. They're determinations where American lives and property are, are in some threat of continuing yeah. risk. Now, this is in the D.C. Circuit's opinion. The district yes. court, the fact finders think not. Yes. And the D.C. Circuit, which is known as a conservative court, has in every single case that's been appealed to them reversed the district court and held these people for the rest of their lives in detention in Guantanamo. Uh, that's true, although um, I don't know that you can simply derive from that that there's this rubber stamp process. I mean, they, they're, they're, these are federal judges who I, I don't think it's appropriate just to sort of impugn the integrity and say, well, they're all just sort of sort of doing whatever the executive asks them to do. You know, they're, they're federal judges who are l really going over the evidence to the extent that they can. Now, maybe we can quibble about the degree of deference and the, the, the processes which they're following. But I just saw a decision just issued just yesterday um, where the Justice Department argued that that the rights to counsel terminated at the at the end of a successful habeas, or, or I'm sorry, an unsuccessful habeas petition, and the D.C. Circuit ruled otherwise, meaning that even if you lose your habeas uh, uh, petition, you have the continuing right to counsel. So they're not just sort of rolling over and doing what the executive branch asked them to do. Well, to me, it sounds like habeas, which was promised by the Supreme Court decision, has become sort of an empty promise for these detainees. Bahar, what's your take on that? Uh, I, I agree completely. And it wasn't the D.C. Circuit that issued that decision. It was a district court. Right. And we all, the detainees lawyers, are terrified that the government will appeal to the D.C. Circuit, get a stay and reverse it, because that is the mm -hmm. last court we want to be in. Um, and I think um, I, you know, I, I, of course, we can't impugn the integrity of of the the, the court. They're generally fair-minded people, but um, I think if you unpack what the D.C. Circuit has done, they have ensured that um, the government will prevail in every case by crediting, giving the the government's evidence a presumption of accuracy. Uh, expanding the detention standard far broader than what the district court would have wanted to do, in some cases far broader than what the administration would have argued for, um, and reviewing factual findings by the district court de novo, which a, a court of appeals shouldn't do. Um, and so I think Boumediene is not the law of the land anymore. Um, and I think that, that being the Supreme Court case, the Supreme in Court's uh, yeah. decision that, that guaranteeing a meaningful habeas review by courts that is at least somewhat skeptical or skeptical enough to uphold the purposes of the great writ. Um, and so that, for me, has been uh, an area of great disappointment about the, the role of the courts. Well, Melina, let me ask you to clarify something that Mike had said about recidivism. He said that there was some percentage. What did you say, Mike? Eight percent? About 28 percent. 28 percent that, that are recidivists. Isn't it true, Melina, that the definition of recidivism is quite broad and even people who have made speeches against the United States count the same as people who rejoin the battlefield for purposes of that statistic? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it's entirely unclear as to, you know, we, we've, we you know, under the Obama administration, even the press, we've used these terms of jihadist, Islamist, you know, for, uh, all sorts of terms. And it's unclear as to what roles, what kinds of acts a lot of these indi individuals have committed against the United States. And so, yes, we, you know, we, we catch somebody making statements against the United States and we say, aha, recidivist. One additional point I would make regarding that is that if we are to detain somebody and it turns out that person actually hadn't done much against the United States, the likelihood then after we release them of that person hating the United States and wanting to engage in all sorts of bad acts against the United States is higher, I would argue. And the likelihood that that person's family members also will hate the United States and want to hurt us is also higher. So I think it... Well, so you're saying is even if they weren't a, a security risk when we took them in, after we've kept them in custody down in Flor in uh, Cuba for eight years, they kind of get yeah, angry my, at us and I then think they the, become a security I think risk. the likelihood is they don't don't like us very much no. and all their family members really don't like us very much either. So I think it be gets back to being very careful in the first place as to who we detain, who we target, who we go after. And this is actually the problem with what the D.C. Circuit has done in that sense. This is Mike Newton. Go ahead. Technically, is that you know our basis to hold people under either military law or now the federal habeas structure 
um, resolve, uh, rests entirely upon the premise that this person, if released, poses a danger or an imminent threat to U.S. interests. And that's really the evidentiary standard. And so, so what Melina is really saying is there's a lot of cases where that's a difficult case to make. And yet, yet we have seen courts that have erred on the side of simply accepting at face value claims to that, even in the absence of or, or, or the presence of very, very shaky evidence. Now, Bahart, when I was researching some of your statements, I saw one where you said that President Obama's hands have been tied not by Congress or the courts, but rather by the previous actions of the Bush administration. And in particular, you said that because they use torture during interrogations, it's made it impossible for the president to take these cases to ordinary courts. Can you explain that? So I, I, I'm not sure when I made that statement, but I think it's um, I would revise it because I think uh, the Obama administration did try and uh, set a number of uh, cases for criminal trial and then uh, set up a procedure with the Justice Department and the FBI to send down what they called clean teams and to build a case that was independent of any interrogation statements and that those cases could in fact proceed to trial and Attorney General Holder said he was confident we would get convictions as a result of that independent evidence. Um, so uh, it made it harder but they were able to do it and then ultimately the, the, the but for cause I think um, was Congress's decision um, um, to with, uh, to withhold funding for any trials that would happen in New York, in addition to, I think, some some uh, public and political opposition to bringing uh, terrorist suspects uh, into New York City. Now, Jack Goldsmith, author of uh, The Accountability President, um, haven't forgot about you there. Let me f- ask a follow-up about this concept of torture and accountability, which is in the title of your book. And in particular, look at the case of John Yu. Um, John Yu was the lawyer that had written the so-called torture memos. And when you got into your position, you actually rescinded those. So in the case of John Yu, he seems to have gotten a pass. Uh, is the, how do you see that? Um, I don't think John has gotten a pass. Um, and I think that uh, he's been subject to, in fact, he hasn't gotten a pass at all. He's been subject to extraordinary scrutiny, unprecedented scrutiny, I would say, inside the executive branch, in federal courts, in the public. Um, by You say by getting a pass, I assume you mean that he hasn't been criminally prosecuted. Right. Uh, but I don't consider that the only means of accountability, and I don't know of any definition of accountability that limits it just to criminal prosecution. And so you think the story of John Yu does send a signal for future lawyers to be a lot more careful? There's, there's no doubt that it does. Ask any national security lawyer in the government about uh, whether they're significantly more careful with what they do and more cautious as a result, not just of what happened to John, but to a lot of lawyers, and they will say absolutely yes. Well, that's a silver lining in the story. It's now time for a short break. When we return, the panelists and I will be talking about the most controversial issue of all, the president's power to order the killing of suspected terrorists, including U.S. citizens, without any judicial review. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy. I'm Michael Scharf, the Associate Dean at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. And with me in our studio today are Jack Goldsmith, the author of Power and Constraint, The Accountable Presidency After 9-11, Bahar Azmi, the Director of the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York City, Colonel Mike Newton of Vanderbilt University, and Professor Melena Stereo of Cleveland State University. We've been talking about the president's powers during an endless war on terrorism. Now I want to look specifically at one of the most controversial aspects of that, the policy of using predator drones to kill suspected terrorists, including American citizens, outside of the battlefield. The issue was discussed in previous broadcasts of Talking Foreign Policy, but we have a new collection of experts, and I want to begin this segment with a question for Jack Goldsmith. Jack, who was the Assistant Attorney General of the United States during the Bush administration. Jack, the ACLU brought a lawsuit about the targeted killing policy, and the court held that it was blocked from reviewing it by the political question doctrine. You've described this, I believe, as judicial approval of the drone policy, but isn't it more accurate to describe that as a judicial dodge? I don't think it was, I don't think I quite described it as judicial approval of the drone policy, because the judge didn't remark on the policy, he didn't approve the policy itself, and in fact, he didn't even say that it was lawful. 
What he said was that the Constitution, he interpreted the Constitution and said the Constitution left the issue of the legality of those strikes to the Congress and the President, to the political branches. That's what the political doctrine, political question doctrine means in that context. So I don't think you can call it a dodge if you like. That, that judge took his obligations very seriously. He interpreted the Constitution on the merits. And he said he held, and I think correctly so, that the Constitution left that issue, that difficult issue about targeting an American citizen in war to the president and the Congress. So in the end, the plaintiff lost, the president won, and the perception, at least for the American people, is that there has been some kind of judicial imprimatur. Oh, that's true. For this. And I would say that, that, that I agree with that. I think that I would even go further, that the, the New York Times headline is President Wins Drone Case. And more broadly, I think that President Obama is in a much stronger legal position as a result of that case than he was before that case was brought, because now he can at least point to one precedent that says, look, the Constitution has been interpreted by an independent branch of the government, a federal judge, who said that this was an issue that was not for courts to decide. It was an issue for the president and Congress to decide. Now, that was a case, I believe, of a plaintiff going in when there was some kind of a, a rumor that his son was on the kill list, and he wanted to get information about that to save his son. Let me ask Bahar Azmi, do you think that the courts should be able to review targeted killing after the fact? Is that different than this case? So it would be more like a wrongful death action mm -hmm. taken against police for excessive or unjustified use of force. We do, and we can put our money where our mouth is because the Center for Constitutional Rights, along with the ACLU, has filed such a wrongful death action challenging the legality of the uh, targeted killing of Anwar al awlaki who was specifically on a kill list, another U.S. citizen, Samir Khan, who wasn't on a list but was presumably collateral damage, and Anwar al awlaki's 16-year-old son who was killed at an open-air restaurant in a, a strike two weeks later. Um, and, and the 16-year-old's also an American citizen? He's also an American citizen um, and was not targeted. It was part of a, a strike in an open-air restaurant that killed a half dozen civilians. And so this li litigation argues that any citizen, any civilian, um, is entitled to the protections of due process, that is a charge or a trial, uh, unless they're directly engaged in hostilities. And your analogy to a wrongful death action is a correct one. That is, uh, a criminal suspect should be apprehended and tried unless he poses some imminent threat to law enforcement. In that situation, lethal, lethal force can be applied. And I actually didn't know that this case had been filed. What court is that in? Uh, that's in the district court in D.C. So you're back in the same court that so, we were talking about. So our, we're, we're familiar. It's our favorite court. And, and the <laughs> reason these cases all go to that court is because? Well, it's typically where, the, where we can get personal jurisdiction over all the defendants. And the defendants uh, being Obama, the Department of Justice, the folks that are in the federal government uh, in D.C. Primarily uh, CIA individuals and mm -hmm. individuals who run the program mm -hmm. that identifies who should be put on the kill list. Now, I want to get back to Melina Stereo, our international law professor. You've spoken and written a lot about this issue. What's the standard that the administration is now using to decide who to kill with these predator drones? So is your question regarding American citizens who are being targeted or just Is, is it anybody? a different standard? So it is a different standard. Um, our Attorney General Eric Holder gave a much anticipated speech in March of this year where he announced what the policy would be regarding the targeted killing of American citizens. Now this only applies to American citizens. It does not apply to non-American citizens. So American citizens can be targeted if they're located abroad, if capture is not feasible, if they're engaged in hostile acts against the United States, um, if they pose an imminent threat to the United States. So all of these ifs have to be satisfied in order for an American citizen to be targeted. And then who's for, making this decision? Well, the decision is being made by the executive branch, and it's not being checked by anybody before. And, and, and when you say the executive branch, I, I know there were some news uh, reports saying that President Obama himself has these cards that he reads <laughs> and decides who to say yes to kill and who to say no to kill. Is that that's a that pretty accurate? scary account. But the, the problem with the drone program, I think, in general, is that there are, there's all this secrecy surrounding it because, for the most part, the drones have been operated by the CIA. And so there are no public documents really telling us about how these decisions are being made as to who can be targeted. You know, Eric Holder announced what the policy is, but how that's being applied, we don't really know. And that gets right back to what you were saying at the top of the hour, Jack, that the thing that should keep us up at night is what they're not telling us. I agree. And I'm, while I'm generally supportive of 
the legality of the drone strikes as they've been conducted. I also think that the administration is keeping too much information from the public, could do a much better job of disclosing information, uh, especially about the processes and criteria by which these mm-hmm. decisions are made. And how can we get that information? As, as lawyers, what can we do? File Freedom of Information? There are all sorts of things going on. The, the, the truth is, 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 is that the, the ACLU and the CCR's first lawsuit against al the one that failed on the – it succeeded in many respects. It raised the profile of the issue. People in Congress are more interested now. There have been tons of leaks to the press. There have been disclosures. There are FOIA cases going on. We actually know quite a bit more now about what's going on than we did when the first ACLU-CCR case was brought but um, the problem is they, that the thing that really bothers me the most is the level of, of, of nondisclosure combined with what's the obvious manipulation by the administration of the secrecy system. They disclose all sorts of facts through leaks to the press, putting them in a good light. And, um, but then they take this hardcore stance in, in court, in which they say it's a state secret or it's, and, and we can't disclose it. And so if, if they've said something publicly, they can then turn around and go into court and say, I'm sorry, we can't disclose they, it because it's secret? A, they've walked a very fine line in which they have, in an official capacity, winked and nodded but not ever said, yes, we've done this. They've been very careful in their language not to, quote, unquote, confirm the program. There have been tons of leaks to the press, obviously, with high-level officials not named. And in court, they argue that the program is still officially classified and can't be revealed. That gamesmanship is what I think is really appalling about the secrecy policy surrounding the drones. And there's no reason why they can't disclose, in my opinion, a lot more information, and they should. Bahar, has your organization been arguing these cases as well? Yes, yes. We're involved in a a second litigation challenging the legality of the killing. Um, We have some Freedom of Information Act requests to try and surface some of the justifications for the policy. And just to underscore Jack's point about the CIA's position in one Freedom of Information Act lawsuit brought by the CIA, um, sorry, brought by the ACLU, the CIA has taken the official position that will not confirm or deny the existence of a targeted killing program in court um, and the same targeted killing program that Jack talks about in his book that we're all talking about in an Alice in Wonderland way that actually And that the administration talks about every day publicly and through leaks. Now, I just read in today's newspaper that Congress has authorized the use of drones in the United States, and there's a debate going on about whether those drones can be armed and potentially do targeted killings or whether they only can be used for surveillance. But that decision hasn't been made yet. Mike Newton, is this something that should also keep us up at night? Well, I, I've spoken a lot in public about, as, as Jack has, about the need to be more forthcoming. Uh, but just to be clear on the other side is the executive obligation to protect Americans, and in particular in the context of the what Jack calls the security bureaucracy, you know, there really are sources and methods that don't need to be talked about, either in an open court case or in the New York Times, that really do have implications, not only for the narrow context of a case, uh, but for the larger, lo- longer-term effort in this war without end, if we want to call it that, to protect Americans. I mean, in the case of al there's clear communication between him and the Fort Hood shooter. And, and that comes out after the fact. Um, how many other situations are out there like that? Who else is being tracked? What other American lives might be saved? I'm not sure that the administration needs to talk about that. But I think after the fact, they absolutely need to talk about as much as they can. And more importantly, for our purposes, the legal criteria. These are real fuzzy kinds of legal criteria. Now, now speaking that of that, Elena, you started to tell us that there's one criteria for U.S. citizens and another for non-U.S. citizens. Can you finish that thought? Sure. So regarding U.S. citizens, there's this imminency requirement, which really comes from international human rights rights law, where you can really, you know, you can go after someone only if it's absolutely necessary, if they're an imminent threat. Regarding non-American citizens, they can be targeted as enemy combatants. Now, there's also this term of unlawful enemy combatants, but unlawful and lawful enemy combatants can can be targeted equally. And the approach has been that they can be targeted by virtue of their membership in these terrorist organizations. So they do not have to pose any kind of an imminent threat. They just basically have to be a member of al-Qaeda, Taliban, and any associated forces. Now, I guess I'd feel okay if we were the only ones with the drones, but there's a lot of countries that are getting this technology. It's not even that high tech. And in fact, in Las Vegas, there was a drone convention of all the manufacturers and people from all over the world were bidding on the latest drones. So there's this notion of blowback. Can you describe how that might affect us? Well, so here's the problem. We're not 
I think the initial assumption, and I think what a lot of people don't understand, the initial assumption might, might have been, we're the only ones that have drones, we're the only ones that are going to use them, nobody else has them, right? Well, that's not true. There are many other countries, including places like, well, Israel has been the only other country that's been really forthcoming, but there's Israel, there's other countries. So other countries have them. We don't know how they're going to use them. And so to the extent that those other nations look to the United States for policy guidance, for moral guidance, I think we'd be much better off with a much more careful drone policy, and that policy could be public. We wouldn't have to necessarily right. disclose, you know, in each particular case what the surveillance information was, who the person was, but I think we could announce a policy, and I think Israel, for example, has been a lot more forthcoming with, with their policy. Okay, Mike? Well, I just want to, I think Melina touches on something critically important. Jack alluded earlier to the shift as the Bush administration went along after the first couple of three years. Uh, in part, that was driven uh, certainly by the policy bureaucracy and by the intervention of other other U.S. government actors, but it was also driven by this dramatically demonstrated need to consult with allies. This this idea in the early days that well we've got a, we've got a special mission to protect Americans and it's great if other other countries agree with us, but but we really don't want that. We really don't need that. I think that's a fundamental watershed. So Melania is exactly right. We really do need to be working with our allies and with other states to be as transparent as we can, but also to shape the legal regime in a way that going forward long term really is effectual. Now, the, the use of the drones began in the Bush administration, but it has ex accelerated greatly in the Bush administration, in the uh, Obama administration. Let me return back to Jack Goldsmith. You've written and said that if the Bush administration were doing this, they would get all kinds of pushback. But because it's Obama, there's a different response. Can you describe? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think, but I think it works both ways. President Obama is not as criticized, as much criticized as President Bush when he does aggressive things against terrorists like targeted killing and ramps up targeted killing, he gets much more criticism than President Bush when he acts uh, softer, when he tries to close Guantanamo Bay and have criminal trials. George W. Bush did those things, and he wasn't criticized at all. When Obama does those things, he's severely criticized. So I think there is a symmetry there in our politics that uh, Democratic presidents get more of a free ride when they do aggressive things and much less of a free ride when they do what I call, quote unquote, softer things, and it's just a flip mirror image for Republican presidents. So you're basically saying that there's some segment that votes on the policy and some, some segment votes that votes on the, on the person. Yes, and that's and, especially and true in, in Congress, I think. Well, we're, we're getting toward the end of the program. I want to ask two last questions of this group while you're here. The first one is, if Barack Obama had been president at the time of 9-11, do you think he would have done things differently? And the second one, and you can answer either of them, is do you think that Mitt Romney, his national security policy would differ in any significant way from Barack Obama? Let's just go around, starting with Melina. Sure, I'll, and I'll keep my remarks brief. I'm not exactly sure that President Obama would have done things drastically differently than um, President Bush did. Uh, you know, remember, you know, President Obama is the one who accomplished the mission of, you know, killing Osama bin Laden. And a lot of these issues, President Obama has really been to the right of center, uh, you know, m really in line with the Bush administration policies. Regarding the, the New Republic says he has a classic Republican foreign policy. Is, right. is that something I, you would I, agree I, with? I, I do. And regarding Mitt Romney, my answer is just going to be, who knows? <laughs> Okay, very quickly, because we're running out of time. Mike? Um, with respect to President Obama, or previous President Obama in, in 2001, uh, it's very difficult to go back and imagine what the country was like in those days and what was in Congress. I think many policies would have been very similar. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the speed with which the, those decisions were made and had to be made would have been almost identical. It's very difficult to then predict the, the precise outcomes from that. Bihar? I should, uh, Bihar, this is Bihar, I should hope his policy would have been different. Of course, we can't know. I think one thing I would imagine that would have been different is he would have listened to um, military uh, advice and applied the Geneva Conventions. And former Attorney, Assistant Attorney General Jack Goldsmith, the last word on this. I'll just say, I'll answer the second question. The same reasons that, structural reasons that led Barack Obama to be very much like the late George W. Bush will, in my opinion, if Mitt Romney is elected, lead him to be very much like Barack Obama. Great way to conclude. You've been listening to Talking Foreign Policy. We hope that this program has shed some light on the national security issues that will be debated in the presidential candidate debates in the coming weeks. 
I want to thank again author Jack Goldsmith and our panel of experts, director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, Bahar Azmi, who came all the way from New York City, former State Department uh, official Mike Newton, who came to us from Vanderbilt and Nashville, and international law professor Melina Stereo, who came about two blocks to be with us today. Thank you all. I'm Michael Scharf, Associate Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Thank you very much. Talking Foreign Policy is a production of Case Western Reserve University and is produced in partnership with 90.3 FM WCPN Idea Stream. Questions and comments about the topics discussed on the show or to suggest future topics, go to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. That's talkingforeignpolicy, all one word, at case.edu. Thank you.